good morning. How we doing? Good? Good. Well, good to see everybody this morning. Uh, my name is Chase, and if it is your first time with us, welcome. Um, I would love to meet you, just as my wife said. I would love to meet you. We're going to be around in the lobby area after service this morning. And so, uh, yeah, come say hey. Um, we're glad that you're here today. wanted to um, thank you all for just praying for Carissa and the Staley family. Um, God is doing a work in her life, in her hand. Um, man, we are just believing for continued healing and, and total restoration. And um, I just want to brag on you guys for a little bit. Like, amazing. Like, just the prayers, the outreach, the love that our church has been able to show uh, this amazing family has uh, really been incredible. So thank you. Really, thank you. We are putting together a, a meal train um, for them as well, just to help partner and be there. And so that'll be on Facebook. Um, I encourage you to sign up, you know, uh, do whatever we can, because that's what family does, right? We're there for each other. And so, um, you know, there's no time that the church shines than when there's challenges and when there's people going through stuff. And that's when we get to step up. And so um, thank you all very much. Um, all right, question for you parents. Any of y'all's kids, they, any of y'all's kids uh, suck their thumbs? Yeah, no? Yeah, I'm the only one. So y'all, it's like a baby, like they suck their thumbs. Did they suck their thumbs like longer than maybe they were supposed to? Anybody? No? Yeah? So, so like Piper, um, she was like a big thumb sucker, like when, ever since she was born. She would like suck her thumb backwards like this. And, and she, she did, and, and we were, um, she got it from her mom. Her mom was a thumb sucker as well. But I didn't because I was perfect in every way. But uh, her mom did. And so that's so why she had to have braces and I didn't, but I'm just saying, it's fine. Okay. Just keep going. <laughs> is, that my, is that my shovel right there? Okay. Um, but Piper was a huge thumb sucker, like since she was born all the way up until pretty recently. She's six now. But we had to make a deal with Piper in order to get her to uh, stop sucking her thumb. And so we said, okay, Piper, you've got 30 days to stop sucking your thumb because when you go into kindergarten and when you do this, like you don't, you know, want to want to do that, do you? And so we're trying to do the sales pitch, you know, and, and she was like, okay. And we said, if we get through like these 30 days, you're going to go to the dentist and then like the dentist will have a special prize for you. And then mom and dad will get you a special prize. And, and uh, like, we can do this. And so we like really built her up, really like we're uh, encouraging her that she can stop sucking her thumb. Sure enough, she, uh, she's like, okay, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to stop sucking my thumb. And so we, we checked in with her like every day, and we're like, hey, did you suck your thumb? She's like, no, I haven't done it. It's been two days. It's been three days. It's been a week, and I haven't sucked my thumb at all. It's been amazing. And so finally, at the end of that month, it comes time, and she, did, she, have a, she had a dentist appointment. And so um, she, she went to the dentist, and the dentist was like, Piper, I know we made a deal from our last appointment that you wouldn't suck your thumb anymore, and you've been working really hard. D did you suck your thumb? And she goes, no, I went a whole month and I didn't suck my thumb at all. Can I have my prize now? And, and the doctor gave her like a stuffy, you know, and she loved her stuffed animals. And, and, and then we went home and we were so proud of Piper and, and, and we got her a, a, a prize on the way home for not sucking her thumb. And then the next morning we walk into Piper's room, Stephanie does, and she sees Piper laying in the bed just... And, 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 and she walked in and Piper's just, just going to town. And, and, and Stephanie was like, Piper, I thought you'd stop sucking your thumb. And she looked just like deer in the headlights, like I just got caught bad. And, and, and she was like, did you ever stop sucking your thumb? And Piper was like, right? And Stephanie said, you promise you stopped sucking your thumb? And finally the Holy Spirit did his work, you know what I mean? And, and and she was like, I never stopped sucking my thumb. And, and, and so she had played us and the doctor and everybody just so she could uh, do this. I know, we're praying for her. And so we, uh, but she did. She was like, well, I, I only did it at nighttime and I did it before bed. And so we, we had to navigate through those waters um, pretty recently. But uh, it, have you ever gotten caught for something before? 
were, you got caught doing something you weren't supposed to do. You were trying to maybe uh, sweep something under the rug or deny that you had done something and you got caught. Uh, imagine, you know, for a second, anybody into reality TV? You into the, any of that trash reality TV shows? I know some of y'all are. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was to say, don't, don't deny. This is church, by the way. We got to be honest in church. Um, and so... It, Imagine like you were on a TV show, right? And there was like cameras all around and you were at home, there's cameras everywhere and you go to the store and there's cameras everywhere. And imagine this is your life, right? What would they catch you doing? What would they catch you doing? What would, what would your life look like? Like in the reality TV, you know, there's always the villain. There's always like the person that's kind of like catty and there's kind of the, the, the evil one, right? And there's always like the nice one. There's the funny one that kind of characterize these different roles, you know? Which person would you be? How would you be characterized if somebody were to look at your life and to, to, to catch you doing whatever it is that you spend your time doing? What would you get caught doing? In the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 6, you can turn there. There's a, a story that a lot of you're going to be familiar with. Um, it's one of the most popular stories in all of Scripture. And in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel has been uh, in exile from Israel to Babylon, right? So you might remember Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. They were, um, they were part of the leaders of the king of Babylon, he had recruited these young Israelites, the most handsome men in all of Israel to come and kind of be his protégés and apprentice and learn the ways of Babylon. And so they, they get recruited at a very early age, like maybe teenagers, maybe early 20s. And these guys are going to be the, the leaders of Babylon. And so that's what happens. Like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they, they kind of get raised up and they end up being like the cream of the crop, especially Daniel. He becomes one of the biggest leaders over the entire area. He just keeps getting up in the ranks of his leadership and God keeps promoting him and promoting him. At this time in Daniel chapter six, it's been like 40 years that Daniel has been in leadership in Babylon. In fact, in this time, he's one of like the top three guys over the entire nation. And the king elevates Daniel. At this point, Persia has actually taken over the empire, has taken over Babylon. You've got this king of Persia named Darius that has elevated Daniel now to like being second in command. And then underneath Daniel are all these other leaders now that Daniel is supposed to govern. Only the guys underneath Daniel don't like him very much. They're jealous of Daniel. They don't like how God's elevated him and all the authority that Daniel has and the power that Daniel has. They're jealous of the leadership that is in Daniel and, and, and they try to catch him. They try to catch him just messing up. They try to catch him to try to get him in trouble so that he'll get demoted and he'll get out of the way so that they can take his spot. And so they look and they try to find if Daniel's being dishonest or not. They try to find if Daniel's cheating the king out of uh, money or not. They try to find all these different ways to try to criticize Daniel and condemn Daniel and get him, uh, get him fired from his role. And they can't find him doing anything wrong. In fact, it talks about how he was just so faithful, he was responsible, he was completely trustworthy. And so in Daniel chapter 6, it says that they concluded then that they only had one last thing that they could actually catch Daniel doing. And the only thing that they could catch Daniel doing was worshiping God and praying and serving God. And so that's, the, that's where they go. And they said, okay, king, you should make a law. You should make a decree that says for 30 days, for 30 days, you can't pray to any other God. And in fact, if you're caught praying to any other God, then you're going to get thrown into the lion's den. And so they make this decree. The king's like, that's a good idea. We're going to do that. And so they make this law that goes out. The king signs it. Daniel hears about it. And what does Daniel do? Does he do what we do? And he's like throwing a fit. He's worried about it. He's, you know, stressing out about it because now what is he going to do? Does he just say, I'm not going to pray for 30 days and all will be well after that. I'm just going to go hide in my house and I'm going to pray in secret but not tell anybody about it. Daniel doesn't do any of that. His integrity won't let him. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, this is what it says that Daniel does. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, 
He went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room. With his windows open toward Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions? Yes, the king replied. That decision stands. It is an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. Then they told the king, that man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deep troubled because he liked Daniel. He was deeply troubled and he thought, tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your Majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seal of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment. He couldn't sleep at all that night. Very early in the morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish. Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God, whom you serve so faithfully, able to rescue you from the lions? My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his I just declare over you today that if you're facing the lions this morning, that nothing is going to harm you. Nothing will touch you. Can you imagine, imagine this for a second. There's a, there's a law that comes down, you know, the president, government, right here in the U.S., right? They, they make a law that says you can't pray for 30 days. You can't go to church for 30 days. And if you do, and if we catch you praying during that 30 days, and if we catch you at church during that 30 days, you will be executed. So you can, you can go to church 11 months out of the year. You can pray 11 months out of the year, but one month, 30 days out of 365 of the year, you cannot pray. And if you do, you will be executed. Now, you got to be honest, because this is church, right? We don't lie in church. How many Christians do you know that would continue praying for that one month? How many people do you know that would continue going to church for that one month? One month a year. Notice, for Daniel, it didn't say that you had to worship another god. It didn't say that you had to bow down to some other idol. All it said was that you can't pray. And he didn't even say you can't pray indefinitely. You can't pray for 30 days. I know, I know believers that if you were to tell them they can't pray for 30 days, it wouldn't really affect their day-to-day -day routine at all. Because they don't pray that much anyway. If we said we can't go to church for 30 days, it wouldn't really affect anything because we don't go to church that much anyway. And it's, and it's interesting to think about the last time that our faith actually cost us something. But here's Daniel looking at this decision that he's got to make, looking at the fact that if he's going to continue what he normally does, which is pray three times a day as part of his regular rhythm, as part of his regular routine, it's going to cost him his life. 
And I read a quote just this week that said, Daniel would rather spend a night with the lions than miss a day in prayer. And I love that because his life was so dependent upon God, that his life was so dependent upon prayer that it didn't matter if it cost him his life. It was something that was so key to Daniel's life that he had to do it no matter what. And, and, and I'm just here to tell you that prayer is the thing. It is the secret sauce for believers. It is the, the key to breakthrough. It is the key to a relationship with God, to knowing his voice and to following his voice, that a disciplined, regular prayer life, is, there's nothing that's more important than that very thing alone. And, and, and Daniel, for him, he had a place that he prayed. He had, that he went to his house, he opened opened the windows, and that was his spot that he would meet with God. Do you have a place that you go to meet with God on a regular basis? Do you have a place that you go that says that it was as his custom, as he regularly did, whether he felt like it or whether he didn't, it was just part of his daily discipline? For so many people, man, we live based on just our feelings and whether we feel like it or whether we don't, and we allow those feelings to just dictate how we're going to behave. For Daniel, his prayer discipline was such that whether he felt like going three times a day or whether he didn't, it's just what he did. It was part of his daily routine all the time. And so he goes regularly and consistently and spends time with God. Martin Luther has a, a great quote that I love. He says, I have so much to do that I will spend the first three hours in prayer. Now, I don't know that you have to spend three hours a day in prayer, but man, if you're not taking time every day to set aside to just be with God, we're missing it. We're missing it. It just challenged me so much that it was so key to David's life that it didn't matter if it cost him his life. He was going to do it anyway. That, my friends, is dependency upon God. That, my friends, is looking at life and saying, I cannot do this on my own. It doesn't matter if it's going to take my life or not because I have no life apart from God. I have no life apart from being able to spend time with Him. I, I read this this week that somebody had kind of rephrased the Lord's Prayer um, to make it sound like, I think, in some ways how a lot of people sound and how we kind of go about our lives unintentionally. I think sometimes this is what our... our uh, not the one that we voice, but the one that it's in our head sometimes of what it sounds like. He said, our brethren who art on earth, hallowed be our name. Our kingdom come. Our will be done on earth, for there is no heaven. We must get this day our daily bread. We neither forgive nor are forgiven. We fear not temptation, for we deliver ourselves from evil. For ours is the kingdom and the power, and there is no glory and know forever. That is not how the believer, how the Christian thinks, is it? Gosh, but, but if you don't know God, if, you're not, if you don't have that relationship with him, this is, this is what it looks like. This is what life looks like. There is no hope outside of Jesus. But Daniel understood that. He understood that to the point that he was willing to let it cost him his life. And so he goes and he does what he always did. He didn't allow the, the government, he didn't allow anything else to get in the way of his knowing God. And so he goes and he opens that window and it says that he prays towards Jerusalem. Why did he do that? You know, because you or me, we hear this and we're like, well, why did he just like keep the window shut and just pray in secret? It's not like anybody would have ever found out. You know why he prayed toward Jerusalem? I was studying this. So there's a few different instances in the scripture. There's one in like 1 Kings. There's another in Psalm that says that they bend their knee and they pray towards Jerusalem. They pray towards the, the Holy Land, the Promised Land. And the reason that I think Daniel did that was because not long before, and, and just in Jeremiah chapter 31, you know, remember Daniel's in exile, but there's been these prophecies. There's been these promises that Israel is not going to stay in exile forever. 
They're not going to stay in Babylon forever. They're not going to stay in Persia forever. In fact, the, the prophecy from Jeremiah 31 says that, Jer that God's going to rescue Israel and bring them back into their inheritance, bring them back into the promised land, bring, restore Jerusalem and restore the temple to all of his glory. That's what uh, like Nehemiah and the book of Ezra are all about, just all the exiles returning back home. So these were prophecies that Daniel knew about. And so he opens that window and he looks towards Jerusalem because he's not looking at the lion's den and he's not looking at his own life. He's looking at the promise of God. He's looking not at his current situation, but he's looking at what God has said he was going to do. And that's where his focus is. That's where his mindset is. And it's the same for us. That when we're pressed and we're facing a threat and we're facing the lion's den and we're, we've got people and we've got attacks that are coming against us from every side, the best thing we can do is pray the promises of God. Pray over God of what it says, what he says that's factual, what he says is true, not what the circumstance or the situation may look like. That when we pray, we pray God's promises, that we look to Jesus. We look to the new Jerusalem that says every tear will be wiped away and all things will be made brand new. That these are the promises that God has given us. I, I, I was looking, there's eight, over 8,000 promises in the scriptures. There's 8,000, it's like 8,810 promises throughout the Bible. 7,487 of those are promises from God to mankind. 7,487. I did the math, because I'm really good at math. Not really, but I, I, I did the math. Actually, Stephanie did the math at Church Free Church. This is church, I can't lie about it. So Stephanie did the math. Stephanie did the math. And if you, if you divide 8,810 by 365, and then break that down, it comes out to 24. There's a promise of every hour of every day from God to his church. It would take you a full year to get through all those promises if you were to pray each one of them for an hour or every hour of every day. Isn't that beautiful? That's what God's promises people. I, I, I pulled, I, I found actually a hundred promises. I think we have them on the, on the screen that I, I pulled a, a hundred promises that they're going to pop up. And I'll put these on Facebook later for us to, to just declare over your situation. I don't know what one, which one may apply to you, but it says the Lord will fight for you. It's a promise. God hears your prayer. It's a promise. God will meet your needs. It's a promise. God works for you. It's a promise. No one can snatch you from God's hand. God cares for you. You are more than a conqueror. You have a hope and a future. God will teach you and guide you. God is your hiding place. He surrounds you with songs of deliverance. God will comfort you. You have life and godliness. You have victory over death. Nothing is impossible with God. You are healed by his stripes. God is good. You are redeemed. You are forgiven. You are set free. God will watch over you. It goes on and on and on and on of the promises of declaring that it doesn't matter the situation that I may be facing. It may not matter to what I'm feeling like or whether it looks good or whether it doesn't or whether I feel like going to church this morning or whether I feel like praying this morning or not. I know and I believe in the promises of God and I look to him above all things all the time every time and I will not look to the situation and if the, roar, the lions are roaring around me I will remember and I will open my window to heaven and I will see God's goodness every single time I was reading about how in the Civil War, you know, they didn't have cell phones, right? Some of y'all remember that, you know? Okay, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Okay, so, but they didn't, but they had declared peace, right, over the Civil War. And, but there was like all these armies and all these rebels and stuff, they were spread out like in the woods still fighting. And so they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have, you know, um, CB radios, they didn't have any of that. And so some of the soldiers, they didn't get word 
that peace had been declared. They didn't get word that the war was over. And so you have like these Civil War soldiers that were hiding in the woods. They were barely surviving. They were living on berries, you know. They were, uh, hadn't returned back to their families or back to their homes. And the war had been over. The war was finished. It was done. Peace had been declared. The paperwork had been signed but they were still fighting as if it was still going on. They were still living as if there was a battle to be won. And so many of us, as followers of Jesus, we forget that our battle has been won. The Bible says that in Christ, all of his promises are yes and amen. It means the victory has already been paid for that we look to the promise that we have in Jesus and say, my debt has been paid. I am forgiven and healed and set free. And it's now I get to walk it out empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And we're going to see miracles happen because my God is able. When you begin to, when we begin to realize this, it makes sense now of why Daniel's prayer was one of thanksgiving. Because you, you read that, and, and, and we just read it in verse 10. It says that Daniel opened the windows. He looked to Jerusalem. He was looking to the promise of God. And, he be, and then he began to thank God. And so we hear that, and we're like, what do you have to be thankful about? Here you are in exile, unfairly just taken captive to, from your city, from your home, living here now for 40-something years with nothing changing. God's been favor has been on you where you've been able to get promoted, but now you've got these guys that are making false accusations against you. They're attacking you. They're, they're trying to slander your name. They're trying to run you through the mud. They're coming against you, and it's just one thing after another after another, and now you're here, and you've tried to just do the right thing. You've tried to live according to God's word, and it just seems like it's attack after attack after attack, thing after thing after thing. It'd be so easy for Daniel just to play the victim. And to go to God, his prayer be more of a complaint than one of gratitude. And his prayer to be one more of defeat and one more of, of, of wanting to give up and wanting to throw in the towel. But Daniel doesn't do that. He remembers God's promise as he looks towards Jerusalem. And that's why he's been able to give thanks. Because when we realize that the battle's been won, our only response is one of praise and one of worship. Because we remember that Jesus did what we cannot do. That he paid the price for our forgiveness and for our healing and for our freedom so that we could live and find life in him and in him alone. And I just think that Daniel understood something that so many of us may not. They understood that when the, roar, the lions are roaring and the enemies are out to get us and the weapons are coming and all the stuff is being thrown our direction, that it's not time to sit back and, and to lay down in defeat. It's time to raise our voice and remember what God has promised us and remember that we are thankful and grateful and we have a, a, a Savior who's worthy to be praised and worthy of our worship and that we can come to Him, that the veil has been torn and we have access into the presence of God to join in with the choir of heaven that says, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And we get to gather every week as a church, as a house, and lift up the name of Jesus because we believe in the promises of God. And we know what he has done for us, and we can't help but to worship him because of it. There was a song. Have y'all seen Les Miserables, that show? That, it's a show, TV show, a play, that play. Uh, have y'all seen it? Anybody seen Les Miserables? Yeah, it's a, it's a they sing for like three hours straight. It's great. If you're, a, if you're a guy, it's wonderful. You'll never see anything better. Um, and, and, and so there's a song in it, though, that just gets me every time. And uh, it's, it's, it's the song, Do You Hear the People Sing? Yeah, you ever heard that song before? Oh, it just, it'll stay in your head the rest of the day. I'm going to play it for you. Are you ready? You're going to go home just singing this in your car. It's gonna, you're going to sing it in the shower tonight or t tomorrow morning. I don't know, whenever you take showers. You don't have to raise your hand. It's fine. Okay, but... Can we show that? If you, if you haven't heard it, I wanted to play it. I wanted to bring it. Come up. 
that song, that song I was reading about, uh, this, uh, this it, it's been used for like all these protests and stuff. Uh, for like, yeah, there's like this protest I had, I think in like China, there's one in like Thailand, there was one um, in one of the couple cities in the U.S. that, that, that there was uh, people that would get ready to, to, to take up or to, you know, come against whatever was being commanded, whatever was being and they were being oppressed and there was all these people coming against them and, and they would use that song as kind of their battle cry, as their war cry that says, we will not just bow down, we will not just lay over, but we will use our voice and that we will sing a new song. And I'm just here to tell you that whenever we worship, whenever we praise, whenever we cry out to God, that it's a song in our heart that says, I don't care what's coming against me. I don't care what the enemy tries to do to me, but I'm going to sing unto God a new song and I'm going to believe his promises. I love the line that says, when the beating of your heart echoes the beating of the drums. And I just say, man, there's a sound in our voice that says, I'm not here to lay over anymore, but I'm here to walk in victory and in health and in wholeness because I know what Jesus has done for me. And I'm not here to just be defeated and depressed and worried and anxious, but I know that the victory I have in him and what it is he's called me to do, and I'm going to do it. The Brother Lawrence, he was a uh, this monk, he said this, he said, when brother, I, I read this about him, he said, when brother Lawrence lay on his deathbed, rapidly losing physical strength, he said to those around him, I'm not dying. I am just doing what I have been doing for the past 40 years and doing what I expect to be doing for all eternity. What is that? They asked. And he said, I am worshiping the, I am worshiping the God who I love. I read that worship and praise is the only thing that we do this side of heaven that we'll continue to do for all eternity. It's a beautiful thought to think that whenever the church gathers and we sing together and we worship just like we do every week, that we don't do it just with a hundred people in this room. We don't do it just with the millions of Christians that are spread across all over the world, but we do it joining in the angels in heaven, joining in with the saints of those that have gone before us, because we know a God who is worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise, and when the lions are roaring and the enemy is out to get us and the things are bearing down like never before, i just here to tell you that there's no better time to declare the promises of God and to enter into that place where you look to him with grateful hearts and with an attitude that goes fully in his direction to say, God, my faith is not on the outcome. My faith is not in anything else. My faith is in you because we can trust you because he's good and he's faithful and he'll be there. Would you stand with me? Could you worship this morning? Can we just take a second to give God everything that we have
Sing it out. You got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Here we go. Oh, and come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. in his house and he was praying and he was worshiping and he was thanking God. God hadn't rescued him from the lions yet. He didn't know how it was going to turn out. He didn't know what was going to happen. But he was thanking God, not for what God had done, but for what he was going to do. And when we sing and we worship and we thank God, maybe you're in a situation right now where you're not seeing any evidence but you thank God for what he's going to do. You thank God for how he's going to heal you. You thank God for how he's going to deliver you. You thank God for how he's going to set you free and how he's going to set your kids free. That You thank God for, for what he's going to do. And I believe that Daniel, when he left his house, he didn't go into that lion's den scared. He didn't go into that lion's den defeated. He didn't go in crying and weeping and trying to hold himself back. I believe that Daniel did go into that lion's den with his hands lifted high, but he wasn't, he wasn't worried about the lions because he was looking at his God. And I'm telling you that when you you go in to that lion's den. Man, when you look to the promises of God, it changes absolutely everything. They, when Daniel got into that den, they sealed it shut. It says that the king sealed it with his ring. And did you know that 500 years later, there would be another tomb that would be sealed shut? And three days later, that, that tomb, that stone would be rolled away and the lion of Judah would walk straight out of that tomb risen from the dead and that is the Jesus that we worship today it is the God that we serve because he defeated sin death and hell and he has the promises of God and they are yes and amen this morning we're going to take up communion as we remember 